plays right into our next subject, actually, because we were going to be visiting Ezekiel 36 and 37, dried bones and the return of the children of Israel uh, to the land. So now here's the, here's the big question. We've just been talking about this for quite a little while, about the prophecy that they're going to sin and be exiled. Then we've talked about they're going to be at a certain point. Enoch's referring to a time in the future, Ezekiel 36, where the dry bones are going to come back to life. And it specifically says it's the nation of Israel. And then they're going to be returned to the land. Now, that's called the return or the gathering in from the four corners of the world, from, from the nations, from the, the uh, what did uh, that last scripture say? Anyway, as far as I've driven them from the isles of the sea, they will be brought back in. Now, it's, as I mentioned, such a weight of scripture on this subject. You probably wouldn't believe it till you began to, to look at it. There's such a strong presence of this subject in the prophets, particularly in the prophets. Now, um, I'll give you just one example, Jeremiah 16, verse 14, where this event of the bringing back of the children of Israel from around the world is considered greater than the bringing of the children from Egypt into the land of Israel. So Jeremiah 16, 14. Uh, let's get someone to read that. Jay, could you just re read that? Thanks, mate. Jay, uh, we'll read Jeremiah 16, 14 to 15. And when, when he's reading this, um, I'm going to, uh, no, I'm going to ask, I'll ask a question after he says it. This is just an example. So Jeremiah 16, 14 to 15. <clears throat> Therefore, says the Lord, the day will come when people will no longer swear as the Lord lives who brought the people out of Israel, out of the land, the people of Israel, out of the land of Egypt. But as the Lord lives, who brought, brought the people out of is brought the people of Israel out of the land of the North and all the countries where he drove them. For I will bring them back to their own land, which I gave to their ancestors. Okay. So those and many, many other scriptures in Isaiah and, and Ezekiel, etc. Uh, relate to this great, it's like a reverse exodus or it's like it's a it's a gathering the word is gathering or alia or shavay it's a bringing of the children of israel back into the land <clears throat> and it's related to the time of messiah now here's my question here's the question this subject which features i mean it features in the prophets this is not something hidden away just one or two verses there's masses of verses. Why is there apparently no reference at all, not even a verse, reference to this in the New Testament? <clears throat> Beth, you might just have to unmute, Beth. I'm going to take a stab at this. I believe it's because people are no longer reading the, or knowing the Torah and reading these um, ancient books. Okay, and, and how does that not appear? You mean the misreading the Bible, do you think, or, or is that what you're well, saying? Well, I, I, I think, Greg, um, the Lord would want us if, if we love him, he would want us to be searching all the scriptures. So, therefore, um, he doesn't need to restate it in the new if we're reading the whole of scripture. Okay. It's a good point. It's a good point and it's a good argument for making sure you read the whole scripture. Any other comments? Yes. Uh, Glennis? <clears throat> Weren't, wasn't there, um, was, wasn't, weren't they living in Israel when Jesus was here? Was that Israel then? Well, that's a very, very good point, he, that, you know, in terms of the fact that they weren't out of Israel at the time, so they weren't actually in exile when Jesus was around. That's true. And yet Jesus, the prophet, doesn't mention the exile, you know, the great weight of, I mean, it's a very good point, actually, excellent point. Um, any any others? Yeah, Kyle, Pascal. 
I, I think um, I think he does make a, a a reference to it, but I don't think we are looking for it, and I don't know that those at the time would have been looking for it. And this is just my opinion, but when he talks through the Beatitudes, he talks about <clears throat> uh, those who are repentant, those who are mourning, those who are humble, those who forgive, pure in their heart, and peacemakers. All of which are qualities of those who are. Um, have either transgressed or walked away from the commands and everything they inherit because of those attitudes are things like the kingdom of heaven, comfort, inheritance of earth, satisf satisfaction, forgiveness, and being called the children of God. And I think, um, you know, I preached on this once, but looked at how that possibly relates to a nation that is about to go into an exile and how he's telling the, the people of Israel how to deal and how their attitude is to be uh, when that time comes so that they're prepared to return. Okay. Yep. No, I can see that. I can see that where you're going with that. Yes, for sure. In fact, he, being the prophet of his age, prophesied the destruction of the temple. So, and, and you know, that there would be a dispersion. That's for sure. Uh, yes. Uh, and so he's, you're saying he's preparing them for it. Yes, Alan? Um, what about Acts 3, where it says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that the times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed to you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he has promised long ago through the Holy Prophets. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's sort of... Uh you know, a, a, a possible implication there, possible. Yes, Cam? <coughs> I was thinking that maybe it's like, you know, we have the milk course, maybe it was considered milk for them and everyone knew it. Okay. I mean, that's a fair statement too. That there's a lot of stuff unsaid or said fairly, you know, averagely. Big statements were said, you know, almost casting them as, you know, just on a light subject which we would find gold um, because we don't understand it. But, uh, yeah, that's a, there's a thought. Enoch, Pastor Enoch? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, it's interesting to think of what Jesus says in Matthew 24 about his return and then that he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and I'll gather together his elect with four winds from the four corners of heaven. And now we traditionally would look at that as saying that's the rapture, it's the church. Uh, but, you know, when he's talking to a Jewish audience who've had this weight of scripture talking about them being returned uh, and some would link it very closely in with Messiah's coming, uh, I think they would have read this more in the context of the Jewish people being, maybe the last few who haven't been gathered, being now gathered in one majestic final sweep by the Messiah himself. Enoch, it's like we're on the same volleyball team today. It's a, that just leads me into my subject. Thank you very much. So is it possible, is it conceivable that the biggest subject, more or less, in the Old Testament has been completely, it's like no one spoke about it in the New Testament. It's just, it doesn't seem conceivable, does it? When you consider that Jesus backed up the Torah, he's backed up the prophets, and Paul, you know, elaborated on the, the covenant and brought meaning to it, and the disciples and the apostles. Uh, so it's not possible. I, I just think it's not possible, therefore, what have we missed in our rendering or reading? And Enoch, I think, you know, obviously Enoch knows this, but, uh, you know, it was being spoken of and it was being referred to. What's been happened is that we've, we've covered it up with another story. And the story is called the rapture. Not that that's not, that's not a bad thing, but it's been covered up by a, another story around that that uh, distracts us from the great story of the scriptures, and that is the regathering of the children of Israel to the nation of Israel. So <clears throat> it's a work of Messiah, remember, that the children of Israel will eventually be back in the land. And let's, let's look at this. There are some things that Messiah is going to do when he returns. What things will he do when he returns? What are some of the big ticket items that Messiah will do when he comes back. Just, just yes, Pastor Kyle, Pastor Kyle. Uh, yes, I'll go there. Just give us one. So give us. I'm going to give an obscure one uh, from Matthew 10, uh, 23, which says, 
uh, the cities of Israel, well, I'm going to reverse it. It says when Messiah, the, the cities of Israel will not be finished until the return of Messiah, meaning that when Messiah comes, the cities of Israel will be finished or complete. And I think that's a restoration of Jerusalem as a whole. Okay, great. Okay, anyone else? Yes, Alan? Rebuild the temple. Rebuild the temple. Uh, Leon? I had the same thing. So two temples, is that what you're saying? No. I mean, just, just, yes, uh, Dean? Restore the Leviticus priesthood. Well, okay, there's a, the Levitical priesthood, the perpetual priesthood. Yes, uh, Michelle? Resurrection of the dead. Uh, okay, that's a big one, isn't it? The resurrection of the dead is huge. Anything else? Yes, Jay? Write the Torah on our hearts. Okay, great. Let's go. That's going to be a big, very big part of the, the whole uh, res restoration. Yes, uh, Dan? Judge the living and the dead. Okay, right. Okay, There's, so these are the big messianic. Any others that I... Yes, Enoch? Uh, rule from the throne of David. Rule from the throne of David. Uh, yes, Pastor Kyle? Turn swords into plowshares. Yes, okay, so that's right. So there's a whole lot of peace, basically peace in the land, lots of signs, miracles and feeding and the wine flowing from the hills. And so there's, a, you know, the, the marriage supper of the lamb, you know, that's, that goes on for a thousand years, eating Leviathan and whatever help, ever else. So, and, and as you rightly said, someone there, the whole world will know that he's inside. I think they stand there. So let's talk about this thing called the rapture because we we know what, what Messiah is going to do when he gets back there. And what my point is that he's doing something when he gets back there. So he's going back there to do something, sitting on the throne of David, building a temple. It's all very tangible. It's not just happening in some place in outer space. And that's where we want to have a look. So, and it's, you know, in some ways it's the right time to be doing this because next week we're talking, we're right into kingdom season and we're right into the Festival of Trumpets, which is tra both traditionally and fairly well accepted in Christian circles as the day, you know, the, the day of the return or the coming of Messiah, the day of the trumpets, the great trumpet, etc. So, So the rapture eschatology is that when Jesus returns, he will snatch away his true believers, instantaneously transporting them to heaven. Who, who's heard this ever before? That sort of thing. Uh, and by the way, there's many variances on that. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, a tribulation. How long is that tribulation? Is it seven years or three and a half years? Is it, is it, you know, has Jesus come before it? Does Jesus come in the middle of it? Does Jesus come at the end of it? You know, you know, you've all heard these. There's, there's books, there's movies. Go see the movies, get a CD. It's probably online. You probably see it on Apple TV or something. Uh, and I can't remember the names of the guys that, that did that. May I say it's a relatively new theology, relatively new, you know, sort of late 18th century, late 19th century. Uh, this the idea of the rapture taking people away to heaven. And by the way, not universally Christian believed either. There's a small segment of believers, particularly Pentecostals and that sort of area that believe in that particular model. And uh, But I want to talk about if, if there is the message of the regathering, let's re-look at the the theology of the rapture let's just have a look at it it's uh i mean even what some people say the word rapture is not even in the scripture well we'll just we'll put this one to bed the word rapture comes from the latin and the latin word is rapemu it comes from one version of the scripture the latin vulgate which is no small influential book it's a book read you know by the catholics um and the word rapture was used to to really explain a theme of being snatched away. It's come, it's, it's a tra Latin translation of a Greek word, which means being taken away. So it is a biblical concept. But let's go to the main scripture around rapture. This is really the number one rapture scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Dan, would you be able to read that one for us? Dan, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 to 18. 
<clears throat> we'll read that one. I'll get um, someone to read. Uh, Pastor Lynn, would you be able to read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 to 55? And uh, we'll get someone to read. I'm just trying to see who's there in a reading. Oh, uh, I see Glennis and Claire are behind screens there, so I won't ask you. Feel free to come on and show your beautiful faces if you'd like to, and you can be involved in the, in the reading of the scriptures if you want to. And then, uh, Michelle, would you just do... Uh, did I say Philippians 3, 20 to 21? Okay, let's go, Dan. This For is the, Lord, the main rapture scripture. Yeah. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Okay, so here it is. This is the real, this is the real rapture scripture and indicates that the faithful who are alive and remain when the Messiah comes, will be caught up, like transferred up, along with the resurrected righteous. So now we've got people who were dead who are now there as well, but now resurrected, and they're going to meet the Lord in the air. So they're being caught up. That's where that word rapture, repaymu, means. But let's not worry about the, Greek, the, the, the Latin word, but this catching away. Uh, and caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord, therefore comfort one another with these words. So these resurrected righteous and those who are still alive, the faithful, goes up to be with Jesus in the clouds, which is what the scripture says. Now, I mean, first point there, it doesn't say heaven, for example, maybe heavens, but it's referring to where he comes and they're drawn up into this place with him and they're going to be there forever with him at that, at, from that point on. Now, we're going to, we'll are going come back to it. We'll just quickly go to these other two verses. These are a little, little bit looser. They are still connected, but they're a bit loose in terms of rapture. And they are 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51. Is that you, Lynn? Yes. Can 51 you hear me? to 55. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Okay. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For the corrupt, this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Okay, a couple of points there. It's certainly, this verse certainly uh, confirms the resurrection of the dead. Um, and th there's a common term there, O death, where is your sting? He's quoting Hosea there, chapter 13. Death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Hades is the Greek word for Sheol. Where's your victory? Uh, it's speaking of the resurrection of the dead. At the time of the coming of the Messiah, uh, it also implies that believers are still living at the time when this great trumpet sounds and um, there's going to be a transformation into an immortal resurrected state at this point in time. So this is all surrounding this idea of resurrection. doesn't mentioned being caught away and certainly doesn't mention being caught up in the air, but they're two very closely linked scriptures, aren't they? In the sense it's at the last trumpet, you know, uh, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. So both verses there talk about the raising up of the dead, which is resurrection, obviously. Okay. Uh, the one, on the other hand, says they're caught up in the air. This one doesn't say that. Okay, next uh, one is Philippians chapter 3, 20. Right. 21. 
that we are citizens of the state, Commonwealth homeland, which is in heaven, and from it also we earnestly and patiently await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Saviour, who will transform and fashion anew the body of our humiliation to conform to and be like the body of his glory and majesty by exerting that power which enables him even to subject everything to himself. <laughs> that's, that's an amazing version. It was it say right, but it made me giggle. For our citizenship, citizenship is in heaven. What's the next one? Homeland what? The Commonwealth Homeland. <laughs> oh, oh, the Commonwealth Homeland. Amplified. Amplified, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there is now a transformation of our lowly body. Now, people have used this scripture and said, well, hang on, our citizenship is in where? Heaven. But is that what this is saying? <laughs> that, that we are going to be now in heaven? That's not, like... I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying there's no heaven. I'm not saying there's no hell, but I just, I just want to say a blanket statement there for some people have said, oh, you've said there's no heaven and hell. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying at this particular point in time, is this what this is referring to that um, the re clearly this is involving the resurrection of our lowly bodies. What did yours say, Michelle? I didn't quite grasp what yours just said on that verse, verse 21. What did it say? It didn't say lowly bodies. What did it say? Um, it so it will transform and fashion anew the body of our humiliation to conform to and be the, like the body of his glory and majesty. Okay, the body, the, the humiliation, the body of humiliation. Mm. But in this one, it does like the citizen, citizen. Anyone want to comment on citizenship in heaven? <coughs> yes, Alan, uh, citizens of Israel. Citizens of Israel, it's it, okay. Paul, Paul wasn't saying we're going to live in heaven. This, that's not what he's trying to. That's not the point. If if he's ever going to make that point, this isn't the place he makes the point. This is the point where he says we have a citizenship. He's talking about new creation. He's talking about being uh, born again, if you like. It's like we've been translated into a heavenly citizenship. And, uh, you know, you can be, look, I've never, okay, Paul, Paul's a great example. He lived in Tarsus, born in Tarsus, as far as I know, up until this point in his ministry, he'd never been to Rome, but he was still called himself a citizen of Rome. And what, what he's saying is we're citizens of the kingdom. We're citizens of the kingdom through our faith in Messiah. That's what he's saying. Um, and we are eagerly waiting for the Savior. So those that are eagerly waiting can still be citizens of heaven. While we're eagerly waiting the return, we're not living in heaven just now. So, but we are, we have a citizenship there. So th this again doesn't imply a whisking away to heaven. And so there isn't really anything in this except the catching up into the air that is linked to the whole sort of theology that's coming as we lift it up into the air and so shall we ever be with him. We're going to be going away with him in heaven. Whereas the bulk of the scripture tells us there's job a job to do in Jerusalem first, and that is the once the resurrection of the dead happens, what are those big things that have to happen? One of them is there's got to be a restoration of a temple. There's got to be a restoration of this and this. There's got to be sitting on David's throne. There's got to be the bringing of the children of Israel back to the nation of Israel. All of this has still got to happen at the coming of Messiah. So there's a lot of work to do before, you know, heaven, if you like. So... The belief in the rapture, uh, yes, anyway, let, it, 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 there is a rapture. There is a rapture. If the, the word rapemo is Latin for this concept of being caught up, but what that word entails now is locked in. You know, culturally speaking, we've read the books. We've, you know, what we've heard the preachers. I went, travelled with Barry Smith. And uh, you know, used to have arguments with Barry about this. I said, Barry, can you just show me this again in the scripture? I'm trying really, 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 really hard to see it. And uh, <clears throat> Barry was an older man and I respected him. But, um, you know, we've had some great conversations about this. But is it possible that Paul introduced a completely new idea when it's not mentioned by Moses, the prophets, or even Jesus? Like, would he just, because there's nothing that Jesus really says about this, Paul just invent something? Or is he speaking about the well-known solid weight of Scripture that Jesus even? Is that more likely? It just seems to me that's more likely what Paul would be doing. He's a Pharisee. He's not inventing something. He's confirming something. And what's he confirming? 
the scripture we're reading today, the fulfillment of the prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 30, where he says he's going to gather all the, he's firstly going to scatter them, that's the exile, and then he's going to gather them. Deuteronomy 34, we read it just there before, did we read it? Yes. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. And so he's going to bring them back. Um, I, um, Enoch, maybe while we're just talking, he could find that scripture you mentioned earlier in Matthew 24, and we'll read that. It's part of my notes, but I'm just noticing the time is, of course, as usual, going away. I'm going to read Deuteronomy 30, verse 4 in the, in the Targum, Pseudo Yonatan, same scripture, but through an Aramaic translation lens. Though you may be dispersed unto the ends of the heavens, from there will the word of the Lord gather you together by the hand of Elijah, the great priest. And from there, he will bring you by the hand of the King Messiah. So this is seen even in these first century documents as a work of the Messiah. And so, uh, the, and this pops up in the daily prayer, Lord, gather us together from the four corners of the earth, Shamanai, Ezra 10, which is a daily prayer prayed, the Talmud, Pesachim 88a, Rabbi Yonachan said, the day of the ingathering of the exiles is as great as the day of which heaven and earth were created. And then we can read a myriad of those scriptures that I mentioned before throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah, I'll just give you a couple if you want to write them down, you can read them yourself. Isaiah 11, verse 12. He says he's going to gather them from the four corners of the earth. Jeremiah 23, verse 3, it says he's going to gather them from all the countries where I've driven them. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 17 says, I'm going to gather you from the peoples, assemble you from the countries where you've been scattered and give you the land of Israel. That's Ezekiel chapter 11. And there's tons more, heaps and heaps and heaps. And I've got them down in my, all my footnotes. footnotes. Isaiah 27, 13. You are scattered. Uh, you will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain. It says, in that day, a great trumpet, Shofar Gadol, which is the Hebrew, will be blown. And those who are, were perishing in the land of Assyria and scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain of Jerusalem. Ezekiel 37, verse 21 says, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations where they've gone, gather them from every side, bring them to their own land. One king shall be king over them, no longer be two nations, but da da da. David, verse 24, David, my servant, shall be king over them, which is referring to the son of David, who's Messiah. And so you can see the Jewish eschatology is the return of the children of Israel back to the land of a nation called Israel, and the king, Messiah, will be the king over them. Now, is this Jesus's, we said before, did, we, did Jesus? miss this at all so uh, did you find that scripture at all Enoch? yeah so um that's uh, matthew 24 uh you know he's listed all these end time signs all these things that are about to happen uh 24 30 talks about the sign of the son of man in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they'll see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and verse 31 and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven, from one end of heaven to the other. Okay, so is Jesus missing something here, or is he? can you see that he's not missing anything? <laughs> it's just been reassigned to a different type of event, a new event that no one knew about before the 18, late 1800s. This is nothing else but the regathering of the children of Israel back to the nation of Israel. He even uses it, the last trumpet, the great trumpet from Isaiah. He, in fact, uses the, the we see him referred to himself as the son of man, which is the son of David. He's the great trumpet from Isaiah, Shaphar Gadal, the elect, the chosen people, the Jewish people, always in the scripture, the ingathering of Israel and Judah from the four corners of the earth. It's all been prophesied before. Jesus wasn't, he didn't miss this event. He, he squarely prophesied it. We've just probably reassigned it in a different box and a different file. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 37, 
12, I think you referred to this earlier, Enoch, behold, I'll open your graves and cause you to come out out of your graves, my people, and I'll bring you to the land of Israel. Speaking of, would you agree, you know, that's speaking, that sounds very much like a resurrection, even that verse. Mm. Oh, so, it, <laughs> it, it does. Uh, and, uh, yeah, um, I was also thinking of Isaiah 27, 13, which you might have on your notes. Go for uh, it. That it. It will be on that day that a great shofar will be blown. And those who are about to perish in the land of Assyria and the exiles in the land of Egypt will come and worship before the Lord in the holy mountain of Jerusalem. And there you've got a very clear shofar sounding, coming back to the land, worshipping in the temple in Jerusalem. Excellent. Uh, I mean, it's, it's there. If you want to go and investigate it, please do. Um, now, thank you very much for that, Enoch. And, and I'll just finish off on this because then we will ask ourselves, well, what about the Gentiles? What, how, where do we fit into this? Well, We've seen that Paul's teaching says that all the redeemed and Messiah are fellow heirs with Israel and will share in the great her great exodus to the promised land. And he made no distinction. We started this portion off by saying there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The woodcutters and the water bearers are all together. That's what this scripture is about. You've got to gather before me, says Moses. And this is he's a foreshadow of Messiah Jesus. I want all Israel to gather to me. And don't forget Beryl, the, the, the wagon driver. Don't forget the woodcutters. Don't forget the Gentiles. Don't forget them. Everyone's got to come. Everyone's got to come. So how does he do that? It's at the resurrection of the dead. When Messiah comes, he takes them to himself. But the, you know, the later Pentecostal Christian tradition would be that they go up to heaven. But that doesn't make sense with the weight of the rest of the scriptures. The rest of the scripture says they don't go vertically. They go horizontal back to Israel. There's stuff to do there as a messianic kingdom that takes place. And the period of time for that messianic kingdom, is anybody onto that? What's the period of that time frame, that small diversion to Israel? thousand years. thousand years. Thanks, John. And so um, we're going to conclude there, but I'll just say this. Isaiah, there's a couple of scriptures for the Gentiles. Isaiah 56, verse 8, The Lord who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, Yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. And Matthew 8, 11 says, And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And that is traditionally seen as a, the, the point of view is that that's also the Gentiles. And so, and that's certainly Paul's theology, is that we are one in Messiah. Any final comments or thoughts? Yes, Pastor Enoch? Yeah, I, I just, you know, I'm wrapping my head around this as well, because some of this is, is helping me to see it in a different light. And Jeremiah 16, as you read earlier, talks about this great event, which will far out, um, overshadow the Passover, will be something spoken of to such a degree Passover is forgotten about. Now, so far, we've had many Jews getting on planes, getting on boats, getting on trains, getting back to the land of Israel. And that is great. It is absolutely amazing. However, can you imagine an event where all the remaining Jews at the sound of the trumpet in the sky are gathered from the four corners of the world and are brought back to the land? Something along those lines, with this massive ingathering happening through the air, somehow done the exact mechanics of it, but that would be very startling, uh, very astounding. And in fact, it would definitely surpass anything Moses did uh, by, you know, a million to one. <laughs> That's for sure. That's for sure. That would be hard to trump that one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but uh, any other final thoughts? I know some of you may be sitting there going, what have I just listened to? You know, that's okay. That's okay. Have another listen to it on the portion. Yes, John, sorry. Go on ahead. the section that uh, Lynn read uh, regarding the resurrection, it said words like the incorruptible will be, sorry, the corruptible will be risen as incorruptible. Can you explain that? Does that mean that the sinners are going to be raised or already judged or what, what, what's the meaning behind that? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle it briefly, John, just because of our time, but it does speak of the resurrection of the dead. The corruptible will be raised incorruptible. With resurrection, as different to someone being revived from the dead, so, for example, Lazarus, Jesus raised him from the dead, but he would again die, so the decay was in him. He was, he was corruptible, raised 
corruptible and he could sin again. But at the true resurrection, when a person's resurrected from the dead, they're resurrected incorruptible. And at that point, we never quite got to it in our message today, it's what's called the circumcision of the heart. And the circumcision of the heart means when the Holy Spirit cuts the corruptible, you understand circumcision is cutting off of the flesh. The, the, the corruptible is cut away. The, 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 the likelihood of you sinning against the Torah is cut away and it is circumcised. It's no longer there. And that's a definition of the resurrection of the dead where the, the Torah is written upon the heart of men so they are no longer uh, it's it, the Jewish, uh, r- the rabbinical point of view of this, it is the removal once and for all of the evil inclination. And so, therefore, no one will break the Torah. <laughs> uh, that's at the resurrection. And that's for those who believe. And uh, that's an important point. We can't really go there today, but that's an important point. There will still be alive people who are on this earth have not entered into that state yet okay so but we'll we'll talk about that at another point i think we've covered some good ground today